friends, it's your teen and tween librarian, Rebecca, and I'm here to bring you another night of bedtime stories. Now, before we get started with chapter nine, I wanted to tell you something cool I learned about this book. When George MacDonald wrote it back in the 1870s, believe it or not, this book is over like 150 years old. It's an old one. Um, he actually wrote them as a series. Uh, and I don't mean sequel books, although there is a sequel. I mean that he wrote um, chapters of this book and they were released into a journal, basically, called Good Words for Young People from about like 1870 to 1871. So that means like a chapter at a time, maybe once a month or once every few months, kids would get this journal, magazine, basically, and get to read the next installment of this story. So I think that's pretty cool because that's basically what we're doing right now. I think George MacDonald would be pretty on board with a YouTube serialization of his book. I'm hoping. Um, but anyway, I thought that was kind of cool, so I wanted to share that with you. Now, last time we left Curdy overhearing a family talk about goblin plans for something big. And he was trying to figure out how he could learn more. And he wanted to basically try if he could follow them into the dark. We're going to find out if he was succe successful in that plan. So, all right, let's get started. Chapter nine. Chapter nine, the hall of the goblin prince. A sound of many soft feet followed, but soon ceased. Then, Curdy flew at the hole like a tiger and tore and pulled. The sides gave way and it was soon large enough for him to crawl through. He would not betray himself by rekindling his lamp, but the torches of the retreating company, which he found departing in a straight line up a long avenue from the door of their cave, threw back light enough for him to afford a glance round the deserted home of the goblins. To his surprise, he could discover nothing to distinguish it from an ordinary natural cave in the rock, upon many of which he had come with the rest of the miners and the progress of their excavations. The goblins had talked of coming back for the rest of their household gear. He saw nothing that would have made him suspect a family had taken shelter there for a single night. The floor was rough and stony, the walls full of projecting corners the roof in one place 20 feet high, in another endangering his forehead. While on one side a stream, no thicker than a needle, it is true, but still sufficient to spread a wide dampness over the wall, flowed down the face of the rock. But the troop in front of him was toiling under heavy burdens. He could distinguish Helfer now and then, in the flickering light and shade, with his heavy chest on his bending shoulders, while the second brother was almost buried in what looked like a great feather bed. Where did they get the feathers? thought Curdie. But in a moment the troop disappeared at a turn of the way, and it was now both safe and necessary for Curdie to follow them, lest they should be round the next turning before he saw them again, for so he might lose them altogether. He darted after them like a greyhound. When he reached the corner and looked cautiously round, he saw them at some distance down another long passage. None of the galleries he saw that night bore the signs of the work of man, or of goblin either. Stalactites, far older than the mines, hung from their roofs, and their floors were rough with boulders and large round stones, showing that their water must have once run. He waited again at this corner till they had disappeared round the next, and so followed them a long way through one passage after another. The passages grew more and more lofty and were more and more covered in the roof with shining stalactites. It was a strange enough procession which he followed, but the strangest part of it was the household animals which covered amongst the feet of the goblins. It was true, they had no wild animals down there, at least they did not know of any, but they had a wonderful number, a number of tame ones. I must, however, reserve any contributions towards the natural history of these for a later p position in my story. At length, turning a corner too abruptly, he had almost rushed into the middle of the goblin family, for there they had already set down all their burdens on the floor of a cave, considerably larger than that which they had left. 
They were as yet too breathless to speak, else he would have had warning of their arrest. He started back, however, before anyone saw him, and retreating a good way, stood watching till the father should come out to go to the palace. Before very long, both he and his son Helfer appeared and kept on in the same direction as before, while Curdy followed them again with renewed precaution. For a long time he heard no sound except something like the rush of a river inside the rock. But at length it, what seemed like the far-off noise of a great shouting reached his ears, which however presently ceased. After advancing a good way farther, he thought he heard a single voice. It sounded clearer and clearer as he went on, until at last he could almost distinguish the words. In a moment or two, keeping after the goblins round another corner, he once more started back, this time in amazement. He was at the entrance of a magnificent cavern <clears throat> of an oval shape, once probably a huge natural reservoir of water, now the great palace hall of the goblins. It rose to a tremendous height, but the roof was composed of such shining materials, and the multitude of torches carried by the goblins who crowded the floor lighted up the place so brilliantly that Curdy could see to the top quite well. But he had no idea how immense the place was until his eyes got accustomed to it, which was not for a good many minutes. The rough projections on the walls, and the shadows thrown upward from them by the torches, made the sides of the chamber look as if they were crowded with statues upon brackets and pedestals, reaching in irregular tiers from floor to roof. The walls themselves were in many parts of gloriously shining substances, some of them gorgeous, gorgeously colored besides, which powerfully contrasted with the shadows. Curdie could not help wondering whether his rhymes would be of any use against such a multitude of goblins as filled the floor of the hall, and indeed felt considerably tempted to begin his shout of one, two, three. But as there was no reason for routing them and much for endeavoring to discover their designs, he kept himself perfectly quiet and peeping round the edge of the doorway, listened with both his sharp ears. At the other end of the hall, high above the heads of the multitude, was a terrace-like ledge of considerable height, caused by the receding of the upper part of the cavern wall. Upon this sat the king and his court, the king on a throne, hollowed out of a huge block of green copper ore, and his court upon lower seats around it. The king had been making them a speech, and the applause of which followed was what Curdie had heard. One of the court was now addressing the multitude. What he heard him say was to the following effect. Hence it appears that two plans have been for some time together working in the strong head of his majesty for the deliverance of his people. Regardless of the fact that we were the first possessors of the regions they now inhabit, regardless equally of the fact that we abandoned the region from the loftiest motives, Regardless also of the self-evident fact that we excel them so far in mental ability as they excel us in stature, they look upon us as a degraded race and make a mockery of all our finer feelings. But the, but the time has almost arrived when, thanks to his majesty's inventive genius, it will be in our power to take a thorough revenge upon them once and for all in respect of their unfriendly behavior. Uh, may it please your majesty, cried a voice close to the door, but which Curdie recognized as the, that of the goblin he had followed. Who is it he that interrupts the chancellor, cried another from near the throne. Glump, answered several voices. He is our trusty subject, said the king himself in a slow and stately voice. Let him come forward and speak. A lane was parted through the crowd, and Glump, having ascended the platform and bowed the king, spoke as follows. Sire, I would have held my peace had I not known that I only knew how near at the moment to which the chancellor had just referred. In all probability, before another day is passed, the enemy will have broken through into my house, the partition between being even now not more than a foot in thickness. 
Not quite so much, thought Curdie to himself. This very evening I have had to remove my household effects. Therefore, the sooner we are ready to carry out, carry out the plan, for the execution of which His Majesty has been making such magnificent preparations, the better. I may just add that within the last few days I have perceived a small outbreak in my dining room, which, combined with observations upon the course of the river escaping where the evil men enter, has convinced me that close to the spot must lie a deep gulf in its channel. This discovery will, I trust, add considerably to the otherwise immense forces at His Majesty's disposal. He ceased, and the king graciously acknowledged his speech with a bend of his head, whereupon Glump, after a bow to His Majesty, slid down amongst the rest of the undistinguished multitude. Then the Chancellor rose and resumed. The information which the worthy Glump has given us, he said, might have been con of considerable import at the present moment, but for that other design already ref referred to, which naturally takes precedence. His Majesty, unwilling to proceed to extremities, and well aware that such measures sooner or later result in violent reactions, has excogitated a more fundamental and a comprehensive measure, of which I need say no more. Should His Majesty be successful, as who dares to doubt, then a peace all to the advantage of the Goblin Kingdom will be established for a generation at least, rendered absolutely secure by the pledge which His Royal Highness the Prince will have and hold for the good behavior of her relatives. Should His Majesty fail, which who shall dare even to imagine in his most secret thoughts, then will be the time for carrying out with rigor the design to which Glump referred and for which our preparations are even now all but completed. The failure of the former will render the latter imperative." Curdy, perceiving that the assembly was drawing to a close, and that there was little chance of either plan being more fully discovered, now thought it prudent to make his escape before the goblins began to disperse, and slipped quietly away. There was not much danger of meeting any goblins, for all the men, at least, were left behind him in the palace. But there was considerable danger of his taking a wrong turning, for he now had no light, and therefore had to depend upon his memory in his hands. After he had left behind him the glow that issued from the door of Glump's new abode, he was utterly without guide, so far as his eyes were concerned. He was most anxious to get back through the hole before the goblins should return to fetch the remains of their furniture. It was not that he was in the least afraid of them, but it, as it was the utmost importance that he should thoroughly discover what the plans they were cherishing were, he must not occasion the slightest suspicion that they were watched by a miner. He hurried on, feeling his way along the walls of rock. Had he not been very courageous, he must have been very anxious for he could not but know that if he lost his way it would be the most difficult thing in the world to find it again. Morning would bring no light into these regions, and towards him least of all, who was known as a special rhymester and persecutor, could goblins be expected to exercise courtesy. Well might he wish that he had brought his lamp and tinderbox with him, of which he had not thought when he crept so eagerly after the goblins. He wished it all the more when, after a while, he found his way blocked up and could get no farther. It was of no use to turn back, for he had not the least idea where he had begun to go wrong. Mechanically, however, he kept feeling about the walls that hemmed him in. His hand came upon a place where a tiny stream of water was running down the face of the rock. What a stupid I am, he said to himself. I'm actually at the end of my journey. And there are goblins coming back to fetch their things, he added, as the red glimmer of their torches appeared at the end of the long avenue that led up to the cave. In a moment, he had thrown himself on the floor and wriggled backwards through the hole. The floor on the other side was several feet lower, which made it easier to get back. It was all he could do to lift the largest stone he had taken out of the hole, but he did manage to shove it in again. He sat down on the ore heap and thought. He was pretty sure that the latter plan of the goblins was to inundate the mine by breaking outlets for the water accumulated in the natural reservoirs of the mountain, as well as running through portions of it. 
While the part hollowed by the miners remained shut off from that inhabited by the goblins, they had had no opportunity of injuring them thus. But now that a passage was broken through, and the goblin's pro part proved the higher in the mountain, it was clear to Curdy that the mine could be destroyed in an hour. Water was always the chief danger to which the miners were exposed. They met with a little choke damp sometimes, but never with the explosive fire damp so common in coal mines. Hence, they were careful as soon as they saw any appearance of water. As a result of his reflections while the goblins were busy in their old home, it seemed to Curdy that it would be best to build up the whole of this gang, filling it with stone and clay or lime, so that there should be no smallest channel for the water to get into. Sorry, that was kind of a strange phrase. There was not, however, any immediate danger, for the execution of the goblins' plans was contingent upon the failure of that unknown design, which was to take precedence of it, and he was most anxious to keep the door of communication open, that he might, if possible, discover what the former plan was. At the same time, they could not resume their intermittent labors for the inundation without his finding it out, when by putting all hands to the work, the one existing outlet might in a single night be rendered impenetrable to any weight of water, for by filling the gang entirely up, their embankment would be buttressed by the sides of the mountain itself. As soon as he found that the goblins had again retired, he lighted his lamp and proceeded to fill the hole he had made with such stones as he could withdraw when he pleased. He then thought it better, as he might have occasion to be up a good many nights after this, to go home and have some sleep. How pleasant the night air felt upon the outside of the mountain after what he had gone through in the inside of it. He hurried up the hill without meeting a single goblin on the way and called and tapped at the window until he woke his father, who soon rose and let him in. He told him the whole story, and, just as he expected, his father thought it best to work that load no farther, but at the same time to pretend occasionally to be at work there, still in order that the goblins might have no suspicions. Both father and son went to bed and slept soundly until the morning. And that's the end of chapter 9. Thank you for joining me for another installment of Bedtime Stories. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to the library's YouTube channel. You can also find out what else is happening with the library by finding us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Or you can always visit the library's website. I hope you'll join me for another episode, but until then, be well and sleep well.